So I'm going to, I want to start with a proposition today. Um, I want to suppose that you not only are developers, but you're also artists. And I know that's kind of hard to accept for some of you, but I want you to think, have it sink down in you. And not only are artists, but you're also very edgy. So, do um, you want to break frontiers, go where nowhere else has been before, and you want to bring your art to the web? And of course, some of you are developers, apart from artists, and you will be like, oh, of course, I know how to do this thing. We can just use the audio tag, right? Um, so you could use the audio tag. You could just put this little snippet in your website, and you would get um, some things for you, like it would start their network request for you, uh, it would start decoding and streaming and buffering and everything, it would render all the controls so you would get some accessibility built in, and it would also display progress indicator, time, and it would also expose methods so you can control that, like load, pause, play, and it would also expose events uh, so you can get loaded data, error, uh, and that kind of nice things. That's okay, but it's got some shortcomings as well. Like, you cannot really accurately schedule things, and you cannot really trigger um, the multiple sound, a multiple sound several times because it's also associated to a DOM element. So you need to do hacks to that thing to actually happen. And also because they're associated to a DOM element, um, you're incurring some overhead when, when you're triggering the same sound multiple times because the DOM tree has to be associated and all those horrible things. Also, the output goes straight to the speakers, so you cannot do any fancy visualizations, which is right, really a bit of a bummer. And then, that's the worst, probably. Some operating systems display a full screen player, which is pretty terrible, and it totally doesn't do anything for edgy artists. Um, so you would be like, oh, is that over? Is that the end of it? Do we just go and write native apps? And of course, no. Um, we have web audio, and it can solve some of those issues. It might not be solving all of them, but some of them. Um, so you would be like, OK. So with web audio, you can accurately play sounds in space and time, which is what we want as artists. We want to have full control of the experience. So you can also control it fully with a JavaScript API. It's not like any weird JavaScript um, flash native kind of bridge. It also is interoperable with all web APIs, because everything is in the JavaScript space, so everything is pretty easy to, to, to work with. Uh, also, it's not attached to the DOM. It's running in its own thread, so you don't get, um, you know, like glitches and that kind of horrible things that we don't want as artists. And it's also supported everywhere, except Internet Explorer. But there's a link to the suggestion for implementing uh, web audio web in, in Internet Explorer, so I'm, I'm happy in a way. Um, so how does it work? But, well, you first create an audio context, and if you don't any Canvas programming, this is super similar, except that you don't get a Canvas and get the rendering context, you just create the audio context. And I always say that the audio context is this little toolbox that's also this universe where everything happens. Because once you get an audio context, you can use instance methods in the audio context to create more things. It's like a, kind of like this magic toolbox where you get brushes and paints and things, but in audio terms. So you can say, create an oscillator. And an oscillator is um, a basic unit uh, for generating sounds. So then you connect the nodes, you create an oscillator, and you have the connect method, and you connect it to the destination, which is actually the speakers in, in your computer or your phone. And this is how a, an audio graph looks like. Uh, there are different types of nodes, some generate sound, some emit, um, some manipulate the sound, but at the end, it just gets flowing into the destination somehow. And as I said, there are several types of nodes, some of them, emit sound, other manipulate the sound, and other analyze the sound. And you can control them with a JavaScript API. It's also breeze. It's not weird or, or Martian or anything. So you just say, oscillator, start. It's not mysterious. And so altogether, this is how it looks like. And that would generally emit a beep. And as you can see, it's just a matter of time. Like, there's those dimensions here in current time, and that what it actually means is that web audio, it's very um, about accuracy and about scheduling things with really, really high precision. And when I say that it's a matter of time, it's because web audio is actually running in the future because you schedule everything ahead of time. When you say current time, you're not actually saying current time now. Um, you're actually saying current time in web audio time. Like at any given point, T, we are in T, but we're all this already in T plus buffer, well, where buffer is the kind of like some 
pre-process some, some, some pre-process time that is already like preparing ahead so that you don't get glitches. And at some point, it will just return to you with the data that it calculated. So in, in, in light of that, when you say start oscillators and you say start it now, you say current time, but it's sometime in the future. It's not happening right now because we will have to calculate all that. And then you can start it three seconds from now and the units of time here is seconds, so you say plus three. You don't use milliseconds or any of those weird things. Um, stopping is the same, you can stop it now or in three seconds from now, and obviously you get clever and say, like, oh, I could start it and restart it. So I would say, oh, so start, so let's stop, and then start, but it doesn't work. And <laughs> I can't really, I don't have enough fingers to count how many people say, why it doesn't work? Why will you weird? Um, but it's because for performance reasons, some nodes are just one use only. You use them and then you dispose of them. Um, if they are stopped, they should be disposed of, but only as long as you don't keep references. And references means references in the strict JavaScript garbage collection rules, like if you don't keep reference to that thing in an array or in a variable or something like that. And also there are some notions of references in WebAudio, and there's a link. I will publish this slides and you can see uh, what a reference is, but it's in the API. It, for example, you have delay node and it's still creating some echoes. That node is still active and it cannot be disposed of so this is that kind of extra um, audio references. So I use the Firefox Web Audio Editor, and this is going to be the only plug here, but because Chrome doesn't have it, so I have to use the editor. Um, when, when you're creating nodes and you start to dispose of them, you will see that they are disconnected and they kind of like show up in, in that column. At some point, they should disappear. If after a while they don't disappear, you're leaking memory and you should look at what you're doing. Um, but so, so you, you know that you, your nodes are going to disappear, so what you can actually do is write your own wrappers. Like, WebAuth is very basic, but you can also write on top of that, uh, so you can work around this issue. So for example, you could create this oscillator JavaScript kind of class that wraps a node and makes sure that this node is always live when you call a start or stop, and when it's a stop, you obviously try to kill the node. Um, it's not that interesting. So, but using it, you can say start, stop, start, and it's going to work. So that's the nice thing, that you're still using with this, you're still working with um, oscillator thing, but you're not actually having to deal with the same object. It's going to be killed and, and regenerated all the time. And then an example of that, and please don't put the sound too loud because I don't want to kill anyone here. So this is just using that method and just doing that thing, and it works all the time. Um, it's way easier. Um, and then I know that that's boring. So let's look at this. <laughs> so I told you there are some nodes that let you poke into what's going on. So we've got the analyzer node. And the funny thing here is that the person that wrote the spec was British. So that's why it's analyzer with an S instead of analyzer. Um, so I kind of like that part. And they cannot change it now because the spec is there. And so you cannot change the code. So it's going to be with the British. Um, so the analyzer node let you um, poke, uh, poke into the the node and see what's going on in terms of frequency and time data, which means that you can either render an oscilloscope or you can render the classic spectrogram kind of thing. So the way you use it is you create an analyzer and then you create a little uh, float array to put the results of the analyzer because this is going to be called many times. You don't want to be creating objects all the time to put results in. So you create the thing and then you connect the thing, like you connect the oscillator to the analyzer and the analyzer to the destination. So the analyzer is in the middle so you can look into what's going on. And then you call request animation frame, as usual. I told you that this is just JavaScript APIs. And then call the analyzer get float time domain data. So there are many functions. That one will give you some kind of like wave so you can see what is been happening. And then you just draw it with a canvas. And this is an example as well. So we're drawing the same thing from before. And that's not that super impressive. But you could use three JS or kind of like get really, really, really interesting here. And, and the th great thing is that those node instances are just JavaScript objects. They are not weird or mystical or anything, and they have properties, and you can use them because they are JavaScript objects. And so, for example, if I want to change the type of sound we're generating, we could just use the type property. And there are some defaults, like sine square, sawtooth, and triangle. If you've done any subtractive synthesis, those are very familiar to you. So you just change it like this, oscillator the type equals a square, and it happens to change instantly. So it's pretty easy. 
I'm just changing, and I'm just changing the property. So it's pretty, pretty, pretty easy to do that thing. And, but then we have another gotcha. Then you say, OK, that's OK. You change the kind of like texture of the sound, but I would like to play another note. So you say, OK, I just try to change the frequency and say oscillator of the frequency, 880. Guess what? It doesn't work. <laughs> and you will be like, why? Why are you doing this thing to me? Um, and that's because this is an audio program. And audio programs are special. Let's think of it. Special. Um, so you need to access it with frequency of value 880. And you will be like, why? What's the point? Did you really need to do this? Um, and yes, the point is superpowers. Superpower number one is that you can schedule changes with accurate timing, and you cannot do that thing if you change the value of the property instantly. So, um, what you don't want to use ever when you do audio music and stuff um, is set interval, set timeout. Get that out of your head now. Um, because you are trying to do something. You, you, you may be saying, like, I'm just going to set a timeout or an interval as fast as I can. I'm just going to be updating the frequency as fast as I can. And I want to get something like this, right? Updating as quick as, quick as I want. But what, what you're actually going to get is something like this, which is pretty different. Um, and our ears are really, really sensitive to these kind of changes. So what you need to do is actually use the event list. And there's an event list per parameter. And also these um, parameters have some functions that you can use to schedule events in the list. So you can say, set the value at time, so it kind of schedules that the value is going to change sometime in the future. Uh, linear ramp, uh, exponential, like it's, it's like kind of like TwinJS, but with audio. Um, and those are slightly different. You, you don't need to worry about that. And then what would we interplay between, between the events? So you would get all that. Like you kind of program the thing, and then it will happen sometime in the future. And then you get smoothly transitions. And for example, with this, you would just say set value at time 440, which is the starting time, and then linear ramp to value at time with 880 at, with three seconds. So it will just take three seconds to change to that value. And, and you don't need to be updating timers or updating values or kind of like dealing with any of those things. Um, so here's a practical dimension. Um, ADSR envelopes. I don't know if anyone hears about music or anything. If not, I know AD is a what. Um, so, so this is this classic curve that is attacked the case extent release. And what it represents is when you press a key in a piano, which is the starting point, the volume is zero. But then it ramps up to one and goes down to sustain if you press the pedal or keep the key hold. It depends on the synthesizer. And when you release the key or release the pedal, you get back to zero. And that's what they call an attack decay system release. And it's super easy to configure and compute. And it's also super common. Like, it's in this little part here, here, it's here, it's here, it's here, it's here. I mean, if you understand this thing, you understand pretty much half of subtractive synthesis. So we can simulate this thing with parameters and events. Like, we start with zero, we run to one, we run to sustain value, and when you release, you just run to zero. And that's what we're doing. Um, so with this, you can combine this kind of um, programming the event changes with another type of node, which is the gain node, um, which will let you change the volume. And the way it works is they multiply their input with the gain value. So you can use that to attenuate or amplify the sounds. So gain node in practice is like before, we create the context oscillator and the gain node, and we connect the oscillator to the gain node and the gain node to the output. And when you say it's a value of time 0, 05, what you're actually doing is halving the frequency that we have, I mean, the, the volume from before. Um, so if we schedule changes to that gain parameter, what we're going to get is a volume envelope. Um, so like this, I can change the, it's going to be different depending on, it takes longer now to play. So it's a pretty easy way to get nicer sounds. Um, and of course, you can also cancel events with cancel schedule events, which is pretty easy. Um, the superpower number two, which is the one I like more, is the modulation, where you connect the output of one node to the input of another node. So you can 
kind of merge and manipulate these sounds that way. And there's this obvious example, which is low-frequency oscillators. And those, those are oscillators that we cannot really hear because they are so low frequency that our ears cannot, they just cannot. But if you add them or subtract them to other frequencies, you can actually hear those. So they're, again, very common in synthesis. And for example, I want to show you some spooky sounds. Um, we're going to connect the, frequency, the output of one of those low-frequency oscillators to the, input, to the frequency of the other oscillator. So I need you to watch out because it's complex. So we create an oscillator and a second oscillator, which is the low-frequency oscillator, and we create a gain node. We connect the oscillator to the destination, as usual, and then we, create, we connect the low-frequency oscillator to the gain node. And the gain node is usually multiplying by one. By multiplying by 100, the output of minus one, one is going to be minus 100, 100. And we connect the gain to the frequency of the previous oscillator. Keep watching out. Then we change the value to 440. And then once you start this thing, it's going to be changing from 340 to 540 because it's oscillating once a second. And this is more or less what it looks like. And this is how it looks, how it sounds like. <laughs> enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then, so far we've been only synthesizing sounds. Uh, we can also play existing sounds. There are two options. The first one is audio of a source node for short sounds, because it decodes everything in memory. And the second option is media element of the source node for longer sounds, because it streams the sounds in memory. So for the first one, um, if you use one of those, you also need uh, an audio buffer source. So that essentially means that you need to have binary data associated to this thing. And as I said, this is just JavaScript. You can just load it with any other means. Like you can use an HTML, XML, HTTP request, and you can decode it here. Um, and once you get it, you just say buffer source of buffer equals this thing that we just loaded and decoded. And you connect it, and then you can just play like oscillators, start and stop. And they even die like oscillators, and you have to recreate them like oscillators. But do not despair. You can reuse the buffer. You don't need to load the thing again. So that's easy. Uh, with this, I made the pp matic So I can fire as many lasers as I can. And I'm not loading the buffer. So it's, it's pretty cool for games. Um, and then the media element of the source node, which is longer, it's for longer sounds. And it will let you take the output of audio or video uh, and stream it into audio graph. And then you can do whatever you want with that. So it's pretty easy. You get the selector, and then you connect, um, you, create, you create the media element of the source node with that reference, and deconnect it, as usual. And I made this example where I got this little clip of Deep uh, Plan 9 from Deeper Space, um, which is a pretty bad, good movie. And I'm using a gain node in the middle, so I'm modulating the volume using another low-frequency oscillator. So I made it even more spookier than the original. People turning south from the freeway were startled when they saw three flying saucers high over a Hollywood Boulevard. I don't know, I just found this funny. I just spent like half an hour playing with that half week. <laughs> that was insane. Um, but this is just an introduction. There are so many more nodes that you can use. Uh, there's just no time to, to go through all this. Uh, so there are delays, there are filters, there are panning, so you can do three things. Uh, you can change so it looks like you're in a cave or underwater. Um, there are splitter matches if you want to do mixers and things like that. Uh, wave shaper, so many good things. Um, and there are so many possibilities. Um, you can just get user media with media element of your source node, and then you can rea in real time manipulate sounds and things like that. Or you can just web audio workers, so you can kind of create your own custom nodes and generate things in real time with the rest of the nodes and not blocking the UI thread. And you can also use the offline audio content, so you can render as fast as possible and, and do really, really cool stuff. You are the one who says the limit, because you are a edgy artist. I'm not the, the one who says the limit. Um, but there's still more. Um, I've been hacking on web audio for the last three years, and I've been doing the same things over and over, uh, but in different ways. <laughs> so 
I also spoke to many people about all this stuff. Past year, I made a thing with web components and web audio, and Angelina Farrow looked at that, and, and they said, like, oh, this is really cool. You should have more of this. Let's have a repository. So they created this repository with for music, but we didn't know what to put in there. Um, I also spoke to Jordan Santel. He's the author of Dancer.js and the web audio editor in Firefox, and he had created some components based on components, and they were for music and stuff. Um, but he was like, oh, maybe component is not the best thing. Maybe we should use NPM or something. And then I spoke to Max Ogden, and, and, and he's a really, really great inspiration for me. So at some point, everything kind of like started to make sense. I, was, I understood finally all the params, and I knew how to simulate custom audios. And I was going to speak here about music, and, and Sylvan told me that I had to kind of inspire people and that kind of thing. Um, so everything made sense at last. And, it was the last moment for open music. That's the repository that Angelina created, and now it's filled with modules and components for web audio. Um, so far, there's some components, some audio components, and something for eventing, generate, blah, 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 blah. Everything's based on NPM. There's no component or extra dependencies. We're using just Browserify. Um, and then you sort everything with NPM install, and it looks like normal audio code, which is great. And the principle is that it has to be like normal audio code. It has to work with just one, fun one functionality, one module, and it should be composable. And in theory, our wish would be that people use this, or they, they look at this and say, like, well, I can make things better, and they create their own, and we can use them. And bits and pieces become tools, and we create a web audio ecosystem, and we all get to create lots of music, which is our dream, I guess. Um, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs>